Hi guys, my name is Colin and this is Colin Talks Crypto. It has been a minute, but I am back. I just wanted to give you guys kind of an update on things, on so many different things that I have been involved with. Everything from the Bitcoin conference in Miami to the Floyd Mayweather and Logan Paul fight afterwards to investments and things you would not expect. I've actually done some brand new investments and I'm going to share what I've done. And lastly, let's just talk about the Bitcoin bull run itself. The thing that everyone's attention is on, you know, are we in a bear market? Are we still in a bull run? Are we going to see these high prices that I've been talking about for years? And I will let you know in this episode. Thank you for joining me. I hope you guys are all doing fantastic. Let's start off with talking about Bitcoin. I think that's the thing that everyone wants to talk about. And then we'll get into other topics like uh, Bitcoin Miami, what I thought about that, uh, the boxing match afterward, and some investments into Bitcoin mines and some leveraged trading that I'm doing in regards to Bitcoin mines. That is something that you've never heard me talk about before. But first of all, let's just dive into Bitcoin. Really, it's been hovering in the 35,000 to 45,000 or 50,000 range for the past couple of months. It took a big dip down to 30,000 and there was a lot of panic. And I think there still is a lot of fear out there and a lot of uncertainty. That's one thing I would say that I've noticed the most if I was to sum up my observations in the crypto space is that there's a lot of uncertainty. I've never seen such a big divide between those who are still bullish and think that the bull run is still on and those who think that the bull run is over. We've seen the peak at 64,000 and we have entered a bear market. So the video I made about three weeks ago got quite a bit of views and it basically explained why if the Bitcoin bull run had truly reached its peak at $64,000, that that would break every metric and every chart that we have pretty much on the subject, with the exception of the pie cycle top, which sometimes indicates sub peaks, large sub peaks, like it did back in 2013 with the double top. So it's possible that it could just be indicating a double top as well. So even that metric is not clearly indicating that we are in some kind of a bear market. So it's really like 10 and a half of the 11 metrics on the Colin Tox Crypto Bitcoin bull run index, the CBBI, which can be found at cbbi.info. It really shows that the Bitcoin bull run is not over. And that is still my stance to this day. I have just been waiting patiently like the rest of you for the correction to finish and for us to resume our journey on this upward price movement. It's not going to go up forever, but I don't think that we have seen the end yet. And I do fully expect us to see a $100,000 to $300,000 Bitcoin price by the peak, which will be roughly at the end of the year, I think, give or take a, a couple months in either direction. So I'm still fully on board with that. If you were wondering if I had been wavering in my conviction of the Bitcoin bull run, not for one second, not, not one iota, because none of the metrics are indicating that we saw the top. Like I said, if that was the top, it just broke every metric known to the crypto space. It broke the stock to flow metric. It broke the Ruppel chart, the Nupel chart, the Puel multiple, the reserve risk chart. It also breaks the two year moving average chart. And even the Google search term doesn't look that exciting, honestly, for a true peak. All these get broken if that was the peak. So go check out cbbi.info and take a look at what I'm talking about. We only saw a confidence score of about 77, if I recall correctly, um, this recent local peak of $64,000 Bitcoin. The CBBI score only reached about 77. And if you look back at the previous bull runs, it basically reached over 90 every time we were truly at an actual peak. It actually hit about 99 or 100. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to hit 99 or 100 exactly every single time because that would be, quite honestly, a feat of magic but I do expect it to go higher than 77. And so that is basically the reason, and I stick to it to this day. You know, if you haven't seen my last video, please watch it because I do feel it's a fairly compelling argument for why this bull run is not over yet. And so to this day, I hold the same opinion. And if you zoom way out on the Bitcoin chart, try it sometime. Uh, go view the entire 10 year history of Bitcoin, zoom way out, 
and put it in log mode so you can actually see all the different curves for all the different cycles and then it'll get obfuscated by the magnitude. So put it in logarithmic mode and then take a look at the little peak we had recently. When you're zoomed out and you're looking at this 10 year view, take a look at that little peak where we hit $64,000. A correction of the magnitude that we're seeing actually seems reasonable. It actually seems expected. You know, when we shot from $10,000 to $64,000 in a relatively short order, it actually makes sense to have a correction like 50% down or 60% down. It doesn't seem unusual to me. You know, and we saw the same thing back in 2013. But even if you don't compare it to 2013, it just looks like it needed a massive correction. And when you have a correction of that volume and that magnitude, you know, going from 10,000 to 64,000 in a matter of a couple months, it necessitates a correction that's going to last for a couple more months as well. And I don't think that any of us wanted to see that and that we were all just kind of hoping it would just continue up, 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 up in one motion and hit that peak. But that's not how the Bitcoin bull run works. You know, it gets overvalued, it gets undervalued, it has to correct. That's how any market works. And so for me, it seems actually very reasonable that it's going to take several months to finish this correction. It's about a month and a half or two months in and we're still correcting, we're going sideways. And I think this kind of sideways chopping motion will continue for the next month or two. And then it will gradually begin to uptick again. And that gradual uptick will steepen and then it will start to go vertical and it will pop and break through the previous all time high of 64,000. And when it breaks through 64,000, it's going to continue rocking upward and that's when we're at the final stages of the bull run so that is my prediction for how this is going to play out later this year it's just a matter of being patient and not panic selling amidst all the short-term FUD volatility noise fear media Elon Musk all that junk all of that is just short-term noise and some of it's designed to shake out the weak hands and the guys who don't see the bigger picture and who don't zoom out to the 10-year charts and see what's actually kind of going on on a general trend. And when you don't zoom way out like that, it is easy to miss the big picture and to get caught up in a panic sell because you heard Elon Musk talk bad about Bitcoin and then it dropped 10,000 and you thought the bear market was in. And it's just simply not the case. FUD is a short-term modifier of the Bitcoin price. Fundamentals are a long-term creator of the Bitcoin price. And so if you're a long-term investor, which I highly recommend you are, you know, it's really difficult to trade against bots unless you use a bot yourself. Generally speaking, the shorter term trades you make, the more chance you have of being wrong or being outperformed by trading bots or just traders who are much more advanced than you at what they do. And so really the shorter term trades introduce more and more luck longer and longer term trades introduce more and more fundamentals being factored into that price. You know, if I was to make a trade right now and then in five minutes from now, I made another trade. Honestly, it's a crap shot of where that price is going to go. It could go up. It could go down. I think that my chance of being wrong is 50 50 give or take. But if I buy something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, something that I feel has true value, true lasting value. And I say, I'm going to hold on to that for five years. You know, the longer time span I pick, the safer the bet that is, and the less I have to worry about exactly timing the bottom or being better than other traders. You can actually be a worse trader the longer time span you involve yourself with, as long as the fundamental premise is in place. And that is that you have invested in something with solid fundamentals, utility, it gives back to the world, it makes the world a better place, and others see that value as well. And that is what I believe Bitcoin and Ethereum are. And that's why I continue to think that those are some of the best choices for long-term value holding. So I guess that summarizes my take on where we're at in the Bitcoin bull run. And a lot of you guys are gonna to wanna to know, well, hey, when do the altcoins, when do the other cryptocurrencies out there move? You know, I talk a lot about Bitcoin. I have a Bitcoin bull run index, the CBBI, and that indicates when we're at the Bitcoin bull run peak. But what about all these other cryptocurrencies? And basically, while Bitcoin is the dominant player in the space, meaning while it does have a majority of the market share, and that may not be forever, you know, I could see a future where Ethereum takes its place. I'm not saying that's going to happen for sure, but I do think there is a fair chance that we could see that happen. 
But regardless, until that day, Bitcoin is the dominant player and Bitcoin moves other markets. When Bitcoin goes up, the markets move up. When Bitcoin goes down, all the other cryptocurrencies go down. Bitcoin is the dominant player. And so for that reason, that is why we are following Bitcoin as the catalyst and the market mover. Now, with that being said, how do you know then when to take profits on Ethereum or Bitcoin Cash or any of these other coins? And I think that the smaller market cap you go, the harder it is to predict. But they generally, by and large, will follow Bitcoin cycles. And historically, my observation has been that altcoins and these other cryptocurrencies all move later than Bitcoin when they have their bull run cycles. Back in 2017, Ethereum and Ripple, the second and third largest cryptocurrencies at the time, both moved about two weeks after Bitcoin hit its price peak. And so there was a delay. Bitcoin hit $20,000 back in 2017. And then Ethereum and Ripple, two weeks later, hit their peaks. And I think Ethereum hit like $1,400, was it? I think it was $1,400. And so I'm going to personally be modeling my sellout plan, kind of following that observation that other cryptocurrencies, non-Bitcoin, tend to peak later than Bitcoin. So if I see Bitcoin peaking, I'm gonna take my profits on Bitcoin, and then I'm gonna hold out for two to four weeks and take profits on the other coins, assuming that that trend continues. Honestly, there's not a whole lot of history that can back this up, and so it is a bit of a speculative guess. Now, we've really only had these alternate cryptocurrencies for the last major bull run. Prior to that bull run, they weren't such a big deal. And so just take it with a grain of salt. You know, I don't have a for sure answer for everybody on when to take profits for altcoins other than telling you what I'm going to do, which is I'm going to kind of mirror the performance of alternate cryptocurrencies based on what I saw happen last bull run. But like I said, that's really the only other data point we have because we haven't had a lot of bull runs that have included a whole slew of other cryptocurrencies. So the basic plan is wait for Bitcoin to peak and then give a delay to taking profits on some of these other cryptocurrencies. And they could honestly be as much as one month or more, maybe even two months delay after the peak when they start to pop off as well. So that's my answer to those of you who wonder when to take profits on the other cryptocurrencies. All right, guys, so now let's talk about some other stuff here. Let's talk about Bitcoin Miami. So I flew down there and I attended the event you know, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, I think that it was organized very poorly. And actually, I think that they grossly overbooked and oversold tickets. And actually, I personally will never again attend a Bitcoin uh, conference like this, run by this group, because I feel that it was very poorly handled and it's not the first time they've had conferences. So to me, it was a letdown. Just to give you an example, on the first day, they didn't have enough people signing people in and there was thousands or tens of thousands of people trying to get in and it just wasn't happening fast enough. And the speakers, the headline speakers of the entire event were taking place and speaking and everyone that wasn't in that room was standing in a line and the line was like, many, many blocks long. I want to say like it was like eight blocks long. It was so far to the point where it took hours, like two plus hours to get through that line just to get in and then maybe have a seat. But then there might have not been room for you to have a seat. And so I just feel like it was massively oversold and I don't like that. I feel like it was a money grab and only certain people were able to get in and a lot of us missed all the headline speakers. And fortunately, they did record it on YouTube, and so I have to go back and watch those, you know, Michael Saylor and all these guys speak on YouTube at the conference that I paid to attend, and I flew there, spent probably $2,000 total with hotel flights and tickets, probably more than $2,000 actually, and I didn't even get to see the main speakers. I missed the entire half of the first day of speakers. And so, wouldn't go back. And it's kind of silly that I could just have watched all of that on YouTube for free and not have to fly there. Now, I think the main part of going to a conference is all the people that you meet and the energy of the space and being there in person. And that was definitely present. And I did have a lot of fun with all of that. I met a couple of you guys down there. I put a couple pictures up about that. And so thank you for coming to say hi if you did see me down there. And if not, then maybe I'll catch you at a 
future conference sometime. I did catch a couple of good talks on the second day toward the end. There was actually, one of my favorite talks was actually the very last one. It had Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss, the Winklevi twins, and it had Jake Paul, the brother of Logan Paul, who was boxing with Floyd Mayweather later the next day. And the host of this was a hilarious guy. His name, I think it was Tim Dillon. He has a huge YouTube channel. He's a comedian. I did not know this. And basically, he owned the stage. And he was so funny. I was literally laughing the entire time. Such a good host. He was really like the highlight of the whole thing for me. And uh, unfortunately, Tyler and Cameron were not too animated in this particular exchange. I think that he kind of dominated for sure. And... Um, Jake Paul had a few funny things to say as well, but the energy of the whole thing was just really entertaining to watch. So for me, that was probably the best talk of the whole thing that I was able to watch. And it was ironically the very, very last talk. I don't think that they had even announced this talk. It was like a surprise at the end. There was also a panel by Eric Voorhees that I enjoyed. And then before that was a panel and it was called Bitcoin Maximalism, a feature, not a bug. And that was a really interesting uh, talk to watch and listen to. Uh, I agree with Eric Voorhees on what he said. If you didn't catch his little remark, he basically said that it was bullshit. And while I understand the basic logic behind protecting Bitcoin, you know, I just found the particular talk to be sort of immature. It was like four young guys and they just ended up kind of swearing and backing their points up with a lot of like intense statements and extreme hyperbolic and cussing. And to me, it's not really a valid argument. I'm glad that they're excited about holding Bitcoin. I hold Bitcoin too. But um, I think that their method of trying to validate toxic behavior and being negative is really misguided. And I think that the space can be preserved and defended without trying to make some kind of toxic behavior the norm. So that was my takeaway from that. I really just watched it more observationally to get a flavor and a taste of what Bitcoin maximalists kind of say at a conference. And I don't know, I wasn't too impressed, honestly. I think that's another reason that I really wouldn't go back to one of these because they just seemed honestly very tribal and very cultish. Like, you know, if you're not with us, then fuck you. Like Max Kaiser was jumping on stage saying, fuck Elon Musk and like just going crazy. And like, sure, I agree that he's made some misguided statements, but Come on, man, like it just the whole thing was kind of, there was a, a flavor of immaturity and very cultish tribalism. And I just love a conference where it's kind of free and you can talk about anything. You know, at this conference, people would get booed if they mentioned the word Ethereum or any other cryptocurrency. And Tim Dillon did an excellent job of poking fun at that at that last talk, if you haven't seen it. But I thought it was ridiculous how, you know, you get booed if you were talking about anything other than Bitcoin itself. And sure, it's a Bitcoin conference, but I mean, give it a break. There's a lot of other cryptocurrencies out there. And, you know, the mark of free communication is the mark of a healthy environment. And when you start kind of ostracizing people and shaming them, it just becomes, I think, very toxic. And some of these guys actually take pride in that, which I fundamentally disagree with 100%. I believe in an open and free market, an open and free discussion, and that the free market will make the best ideas rise to the top, and you don't need to try to force it with censorship or ostracizing or exiling people or making them feel stupid or booing them on stage. I think that that's a very poor method of exercising one's freedom of choice because there's not really freedom of choice. And you know, it's funny because any Bitcoin maximalist who's listening to this right now will be like, good, I'm glad you're not going to the next one. You don't deserve to be there. You don't belong there. And again, that's the mentality they have. And I'm totally fine with that. I'd rather be somewhere where it's open and we can talk about anything we want to. We can talk about Ethereum. We can talk about Bitcoin. We can talk about Bitcoin Cash. And everybody's open to hearing everybody's ideas. It doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but the fact that you can just talk about it is a big step up from being shamed <laughs> for speaking about something, a particular cryptocurrency that you may like. So that was my takeaway from Bitcoin Miami. I give it a five out of 10 or a six out of 10. You know, you add the toxic maximalism to the horrible organization, and it just didn't turn out to be that great of a conference for me. But I did enjoy all the people, and I took some great pictures and even a little bit of footage that I'll put into a future music video that's coming out. And so there was some highlights for it, for sure. 
Another thing that I didn't care for was the fact that the next day, instead of giving a refund for all the people who couldn't even see the main speakers because the lines were too long, they offered free lunch to everybody who had attended to make up for the poor organization on the first day. And they said that all the food carts would be free. And I went to some food carts and they were not free. In fact, I went to quite a number of them and they were not free. And some of them just said, no, we're not gonna do that. And so honestly, I found like two ice cream carts. They would give ice cream for free and that was it. I mean, that's pretty pathetic in my opinion for trying to make something better where, you know, you pay for a $350 ticket or higher or a thousand dollar ticket or even more and you, you get shafted out of the main speakers because the event is oversold and all they want to give you is a $5 ice cream, you know, or if you're lucky and you happen to find the right cart, you might get a 10 or $15 meal for free. But, you know, keep in mind, 10 or $15, it's just kind of a slap in the face to someone who paid 350 to thousands of dollars for a ticket. So I do feel that there should have been partial refunds for the poor service, and that would have been a more correct handling. So again, these are all the reasons why I won't be going to another Bitcoin conference like this in the future, but I'll be happy to attend other conferences that have a more diverse array of cryptocurrencies and that are just more well organized. To give you an example, I went to Anarchapoco a couple years ago. It was probably three years ago now, and I had the best time of my life. That was one of the best conferences I've ever been to. It was organized extremely well, at least much better than the Bitcoin Miami conference. I don't expect any of them to be perfect, but I can definitely tell you a night and day difference between Anarchapoco and Bitcoin Miami. Anarchapoco was organized, it had great speakers, it had tons of fun people, and you could talk about anything you wanted. It wasn't like you were going to be shunned or vilified for speaking about something other than Bitcoin. And it just had a great atmosphere and tons of activities. Anarchapoco was a 10 out of 10, and a Bitcoin Miami was a 5 or a 6 out of 10. Then the next day, I stayed for one more day and um, I did some kiteboarding lessons and then also went and saw Floyd Mayweather versus Logan Paul. And this was a fight that had been talked about quite a bit because if you remember, Floyd Mayweather actually spoke at the Bitcoin Miami conference and Logan Paul's brother, Jake Paul, spoke at the Bitcoin Miami conference. And so it was very closely interwoven. And basically Floyd Mayweather and Logan Paul uh, began fighting. I think it was around 11 o'clock at night. They had a couple of pre-matches before they got to these guys. And finally, the big match starts. And it's an interesting match, mostly because of the huge difference between these two fighters. Floyd Mayweather is like one of the world's best boxers, but he's older. He's like 40 or 50 years old, somewhere in that range. And basically, Logan Paul has a one-up on Floyd Mayweather in every area except for experience. Logan Paul has a height advantage of like six inches. He has a weight advantage of like 30 pounds and he's younger by like 20 years. And so you have this older dude, Floyd Mayweather, who has a weight disadvantage, a height disadvantage, and he's older, so he's not as youthful. And here he is taking on this young guy, but Floyd Mayweather has a tremendous amount of experience. And so they finally started fighting. And honestly, it was a little bit of a disappointment for the first two rounds, Floyd Mayweather just kind of danced around and I think he was just sizing up Logan Paul to make sure that Floyd didn't make any mistakes. He was just kind of checking out what's Logan Paul going to do, danced around him on the outside of the ring for the entire first two rounds. So kind of boring there. And then finally on the third round, Floyd Mayweather started throwing some punches and they both got some punches in on each other here and there and um, they both Ended the match though, standing and doing fine. And I think that was a big disappointment. There was a lot of uh, tired kind of hugging where they just run out of breath and they just kind of lean into each other just over and over and over. And no one wants to watch two sweaty men just kind of hugging each other for the whole time. So there was a bit of disappointment there. The crowd actually booed at the very end. And I thought that was pretty funny. So, and we wanted to see entertainment. And so I guess I would say we got a mild form of entertainment. And what else can I talk about? I have filed my paperwork for my St. Kitts and Nevis citizenship, and that will be my second citizenship so that I do have a backup plan. So I'm just letting you guys know that that is underway. I have begun that process and it does take a while. So I'm in the pipeline, I'm in that process, and I'm looking forward to having that second passport and to just be able to take whatever action is appropriate in my future um, to protect myself should the uncertainties of the government of America do something that I don't like, I then have a backup plan. Because as I've learned, you know, if you do ever decide to renounce your citizenship, 
the first thing you need to have is a second citizenship. You're not allowed to just roam around stateless. And so you do need to have that in place. And I figure it's better to have that before everyone wants it and everyone's rushing to the gates. And so I'll be ahead of the curve on that decision. All right, and lastly, let's talk about some investments I've made in the recent past. I have not ever talked about this on my channel. Some of these are very recent, like in the past week, and they involve Bitcoin mines. And I can only say so much about one of these because I signed an NDA. But basically there's a large Bitcoin mine. I made a fairly sizable investment in it. And it's very exciting because it has some of the most state of the art, modern cooling technology for these miners. It has the most state of the art miners themselves. It has access to the cheapest, utterly cheapest electricity that I've ever seen. And it's managed by a group that I've met personally several times now by a group of very, very competent individuals, very, very good leaders in the space. And I just feel really solid about what they're doing. And you basically have to sign the NDA before you can get the details of it. So that's about all I can say on that. Unless you sign the NDA, then you can get the whole briefing. But it's interesting because China has just recently basically banned every Bitcoin miner from mining in China. And that's incredible news to those of us who have investments in Bitcoin mines outside of China, like myself. So all that hash rate is going to be leaving and shutting down. And that just means that my profits will be even greater in that particular arena. So I am really excited about this. It is a bit of a longer term investment. And it's cool because I actually have gotten disbursements paid to me as the Bitcoin has been mined and I've almost recouped my entire investment. And now I hold a percentage of ownership that I will have some value in this particular company. And so I'm really excited about that. I'm not gonna drop the name because again, I don't wanna say something I'm not supposed to say, but that's what I've been doing. I just wanted to keep you guys in the loop. And then even more recently, like I said, in the past week, I've actually done something crazy that even I never thought I would do before. And that is basically make leveraged bets on Bitcoin mining companies on the traditional stock market. I've never actually owned a single stock in my entire life. I have only held cryptocurrency. It's kind of funny to say that, but you know, I have these friends who have 401ks and stocks with Microsoft and this and that. I haven't touched a single stock. I have not even held Tesla stock or anything of that nature. I literally just like skipped that entire generation and went straight into cryptocurrency. And I think that was actually really, really smart. Now, there's a couple of reasons why I actually placed some leveraged bets with some Bitcoin mining companies. So basically, I looked at a couple of the largest Bitcoin mines in North America, and I took a look at the pattern between their price, their share price, and the Bitcoin price. And there's a couple of key points here. The first key point is that these major Bitcoin mining companies closely follow the price of Bitcoin, but amplified. So for example, if Bitcoin goes up $10,000, these stocks might double. And so it's actually an amplified bet on Bitcoin itself, sort of. It's like a derivative. It's like a form of Bitcoin. Obviously, you're not actually holding Bitcoin. And I'm currently doing about 22% of my portfolio in these particular call options. And so a call option is basically a leveraged way of saying, hey, I'm so confident on this particular stock that I'm gonna say that it's going to surpass a certain price by a certain deadline. You have to pick an expiration date and you have to pick a price. It's very specific. But if the price does surpass that strike price, is what they call it, by the expiration date, you can make out tremendously. Like you can multiply your original investment many, many, many times over to the point where it becomes actually more profitable than the Bitcoin bull run itself. And so because of the tight correlation between these Bitcoin mining stocks and the Bitcoin price, to me, it made sense to make an amplified bet in the same direction. You know, I'm already betting on Bitcoin going high. I'm already betting on there being a bull run peak later this year. And I definitely plan to continue using CBBI to help me guide myself on the way. That's CBBI.info for all you guys. Check it out in your browser now. 
that's my advertisement. And so right now, for example, the Bitcoin price is around $40,000. I could see the Bitcoin price doing maybe a 4X or a 6X from here. So I thought to myself, well, why don't I make a parallel bet in the same direction of confidence in Bitcoin, but one that has an ability to make me an 18X or a 20X or a 15X. And that's what I've done. I basically placed these call options on these Bitcoin mining stocks with the anticipation that they're going to continue to parallel the Bitcoin price, but in an amplified way. And I'm very excited about this particular investment. And I'm really, really looking forward to seeing the results of this because I can literally take that 22% of my portfolio that I've put into these call options and literally make that worth more than the rest of my entire portfolio. Now, that being said, I'm not saying any of you guys should follow what I'm doing. That's actually why I'm being a little vague on the names of the companies, on the exact strike prices, on the exact contract expirations, because I don't want to even go there. I don't want to be responsible for you doing something similar. If you want to do something similar, by all means, go for it, but do your own due diligence, do your own research and make your own decisions on this. Nothing in this entire video has been financial advice, especially this last part, because it is leverage. It is risky. Just to give you an idea, if the stock price does not exceed the strike price, that target price that I've set by the date that I set it, which is the expiration date, then I actually lose all the money. So there's a chance I could lose 22% of my entire portfolio on this bet if the price does not go to where I think it will by the date that I think it will. And that is the risk, the huge risk for this kind of bet. And that's why it's higher risk, higher reward. That's why I can make an 18 or a 20 X multiple on my money, but I could also lose it all. And if you just hold Bitcoin, sure, you might only make a four X or a six X, but you don't have any chance of losing it all. And if you want to, you can just hold it through the bull run and go for the next bull run. So there's definitely added risk to this where I could lose it all. And that's why I'm just telling you what I'm doing. I'm not necessarily recommending you follow me on this, but I thought you would find it interesting because this is very much different from any of my other kind of investments. It's funny because actually technically I still haven't owned any stocks. I just own contracts. I own call option contracts, but I actually still don't own any actual stock and maybe I'll get away with never owning it. I'd really like to never own any stocks. I think that'd be a cool thing to tell people in the future, but I'm not biased. If there's a way to make money, I'm interested. And you know, I am approaching this from an investor mindset. And so for me, it just made sense to take a percentage of my portfolio and make an amplified bet in a direction that I'm already heading. And that was buying call options on these major North American Bitcoin mining companies, hint, hint and betting that the price is going to go fairly high this bull run by at least the end of the year, for example. Okay, guys, so I think that catches you up on everything. I have been just doing so much, as you can see behind the scenes. My confidence in the Bitcoin bull run has not died down for a second, although it does seem less exciting to make a video when the price is just kind of going sideways. So I guess I'm just kind of waiting for something exciting to happen. It might take a month or two before the price starts going up again. And it is what it is. That is the nature of a huge, huge correction that we are in right now. But I still have my eyes set on the prize, $100,000 to $300,000 by the end of this bull run, which is probably the end of this year. And cross your fingers, you know, all your uh, prayers and wishes for me that my call options go well. You know, I really appreciate that. And I hope that all your investments go really well too. And so with that being said, guys, I hope you all have a great day. If you found this information useful, please smash the like, drop a comment and share with a friend. I would really appreciate that. That's the only pay I ask for back for sharing all this with you. And I'll talk to you again soon. Oh, yeah.